Welcome to Charity Village Connects. Today, we're doing a checkup on our mental health, discussing how professionals in the nonprofit sector are coping with the stresses and challenges in the workplace and what nonprofit leaders can do to support their well being. Joining me today is Paula Allen. Paula Allen is the Senior Vice President of Research and Total Well Being at LifeWorks. Welcome to the podcast, Paula. It's my pleasure. Paula, first, can you describe what LifeWorks does uh, for our audience and your role within it? Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, LifeWorks is a Canadian-based organization, but we are global. We're in 180 different countries, and we support organizations to help them support their people. So we provide financial services. uh, We provide counseling services. We help people transition back to work after they've been off work for an illness or injury. Um, Our biggest service, though, actually supports mental health. Well, you know, it's it's very timely that we're speaking today because last February we published our first podcast episode tackling workplace mental health. And this year we're looking to do, as I mentioned off the top, a bit of a checkup of sorts. Would you say that we're in a different space today than we were a year ago? And and if anything's changed, what has changed? We're in a slightly different different space. Um, if, you, if we even roll back to when we started this pandemic, which was the big impact on our collective mental health, uh, right at the very beginning, we had a lot of crisis. I mean, everything was disrupted. Uh, change on a constant basis, uh, a lot of fear, a lot of risk. And what we found is that people move to a higher level of risk. So those who were in a very difficult place actually went into crisis. People who had moderate mental health risks moved into a high risk category. Um, That was really what we saw. And, And that has continued. You know, you don't just move into a high risk place and immediately flip out particularly since we have been going through ongoing strain. And then we started to see uh, a lot of unhealthy coping behaviors. So for example, um, at this point, you know, it started in the beginning, it went up for a bit, and we are right now uh, four times more likely to have people in the working population engage in risky drinking behavior. Um, right now, <laughs> right now, we're, we're, we're past the worst of the pandemic. We're not completely out yet, um, but we're on edge. You know, after over two years of this upheaval, people are a little bit more sensitive to stress. We see more anger. We see a little bit more cynicism. You know, we're definitely not back to the way we were. The way we were wasn't perfect, but we're still in a very compromised place. Well, I certainly have uh, 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 witnessed it. I think we've all witnessed it as we all struggled our way through the pandemic, uh, the impacts and the kind of um, pressures that uh, all of the entire experience had on ourselves and our family members and uh, and our workplace. LifeWorks publishes a regular mental health index. Can you tell us a bit more about that and what it's been showing you over the past year? Yes, we actually contemplated the mental health index and started doing work on it in 2017. And uh, the reason was that you know, mental health is core to pretty much everything, you know, your quality of life, your work productivity, your work, your relationships. And there wasn't any clean, easy to understand measure of the mental health of the working population. And you can't improve what you don't measure. So we started to build it in 2017, and and really the purpose is to build awareness of potential risks. We're in an evolving society, pandemic or no pandemic. Uh, We are trying different things in terms of support for people's well-being, and we're doing things that sometimes don't support people's mental health and well-being. And we wanted an opportunity to measure where we are, but also do a deep dive into some important issues so we understood what works, what doesn't work, what people need, and to provide some guidance to employers. Uh, Your most recent index, published in December, had some key insights regarding mental health and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can you talk about those findings? 
Yeah, well, one thing is absolutely certain is that there is significant overlap between diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging and uh, a mentally healthy environment. Like, even if you take the words, um, you know, inclusion, equity, belonging are all things that impact mental health. And, and what we find is that certain groups, you know, uh, uh, racialized groups, certain ethnic groups, you know, people uh, with uh, various uh, sexual, uh, sexual orientations, their mental health is actually lower in terms of the score overall. So it doesn't mean that people aren't functioning and doing their job, but they're doing so with burden. And we, what we did is we asked the entire population uh, what their what their experience is at work, because, you know, you bring certain things uh, into this world, but a lot of our mental health and well-being is impacted by our environment. So we wanted to really understand that environment. So we asked questions of the entire population and we found that um, people in different diverse groups had more negative experiences, including people who have identified disabilities. So more likely to be overlooked, more likely to be interrupted, you know, the things that actually add strain and, and diminish you. So that was some insight into what's happening in the workplace, conscious or unconscious, and, and really we validated the correlate with people's mental health. Workplace mental health continues to be a high priority for employees. What have you seen emerge as some of the top concerns of employees? When we have any kind of crisis like we did over the over the, the pandemic, your, your priorities become a lot clearer. You know, what is important becomes a lot clearer. And people realized, I think, their vulnerability in terms of their mental health and well-being. We all have vulnerability is if you're human, you do, uh, but sometimes it's not at the forefront of our awareness. So protecting yourself, enhancing your well-being has become very important. So people are looking at employers in terms of, you know, is this a place where I'm going to have harm? You know, is this a place where, you know, um, my well-being is not important, so I don't have support, I don't have services, I don't have a workplace environment that's going to help me, me, me flourish, and they are rejecting those environments and workplaces. So it's not just about the dollar, it's not just about the title, it is about a, a really clear recognition at this point that there truly is no work-life separation. Your life is your life and your work is a component of your life. So the standards that you have for your life overall are the standards that you have for your workplace. Well, that is just a, a, quite a profound observation, really. How should leaders address these concerns? Do you have any advice for nonprofit leaders to implement and, and better support their staff in order to retain them or attract them to their workplace? Yeah, I think it's important that leaders do understand that they they can have tremendous positive influence. You know, one of the things that we found in the mental health index is <clears throat> the entire population was under strain. There was no question about it over this pandemic. But when employees uh, spoke about their workplaces, those were places that prioritized their mental health and well-being, invested in things like promotion of services. Managers were trained so they were able to step in and show that kind of you know, personal empathy and concern. Those those things made a difference. Those people separated from the average working Canadian and their mental health scores were better. You know, they 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 either declined less or they didn't decline at all. So, you know, you, 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 no one factor, including the workplace, can take accountability for everything. But workplaces can mitigate even this tremendous societal strain that, that, that's, been, that, that's been going on. So what we've also found is that it's not that hard. 
<laughs> it's just that people need to make sure that they're conscious that they have impact on other people. Mental health is a team sport. It's like you, our interactions make a difference. So first and foremost, do no harm. You know, when people don't feel safe, you know, when they feel belittled, when they feel there's gossip, you know, all of these things are harmful. You know, um, if you show empathy to others, you that that in in and itself you know says that you value that other person as a human being and that is super important you can't solve everybody's problems but showing that you value someone else is really important uh, we were talking about diversity equity and inclusion inclusiveness you know listening to people hearing their concerns because you know you, it's hard to have a blanket statement around this every single organization should present itself in a certain way some of it depends on the on the on the on the on the nature of the work and and the last thing i would say i could actually say a lot more but i'm being kind to you and this is the last thing i'll say for this this section is um train your managers you know i think sometimes we feel that you know you hire good people and they'll just do good things and yes that's true to a certain extent but none of us in our generations learned how to deal with mental health in the workplace. We didn't speak about it. We don't necessarily, other than stumbling across good information, even know how to take care of ourselves well. So the idea of really just helping managers know and feel comfortable when they see somebody struggling, what that conversation can look like. So they're within the role of a manager, they're not a counselor, but they don't have that, they don't go either in one of two ways, either ignore the situation and just isolate that person even more you're struggling you 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 know as an analogy you fall off you fell off a ladder and everybody is just walking by you know you're in pain you don't you want to be recognized um or do the other which is um almost diminish that person's strength by coddling you know oh i don't want to give them the stressful meeting i don't want to give them the stressful this you know it, it's it's neither is good so helping managers with training to give them the skills on how to make a positive difference within their role is a very positive tangible step that i would recommend for all employers yeah it certainly is a new world i remember uh, the times when I was beginning my career where if you had mental health issues, you just didn't mention them and you certainly didn't bring it to the workplace attention um, because it was seen to be a career, um, you know, barrier. Uh, it could it could ruin your career. So um, I think I think we really have come a long way, don't you think? We definitely absolutely have. And we still have a ways to go. I, I, I do think that we still have a lack of knowledge around mental health and how the brain works and the, the interplay between physical and emotional factors. You know, there's still a little bit of mystery. And what I find is the more knowledgeable one is about mental health, then the less stigma one has, the less fear one has, uh, the more open one is. So I do think that there's an opportunity for us to have more education. I think, you know, it's great that it's no longer really socially acceptable, you know, to be stigmatizing. Uh, but I don't want it just to be on the surface. Like I want people to have the opportunity to understand part of our own health. So it isn't even just your behavior to someone else, because, you know, the social part can impact your behavior. But we also have self stigma where people feel badly about themselves, they won't speak about themselves, they would be kind and empathetic to someone else and very harsh in their own self talk. We want people to understand mental health well enough. So we don't only have so we reduce the social stigma and the self stigma. And what are some of the things that organizations are really getting wrong when it comes to workplace mental health? And what do you think they can do to fix it? I, I, I think the first thing is making assumptions. You know, um, if you're if you're developing any kind of strategy in any business, you make sure that you understand, you know, what is necessary, you know, what your situation requires. You engage people, you make sure that, you know, you're not doing something for someone without having their voice in it. You know, we've had a lot of things that are not bad, but but I, I you know, 
most often I would say it's not enough. So if you have a, a very harsh an, an environment, you know, you don't have managers who are trained, you don't even have uh, benefits and su support and services when people get into, into crisis, uh, but you implement a four day work week. I'm not saying that four day work week is a bad thing. I'm just saying that there's other things, you know, do you want to have four days that are horrible <laughs> and just have that one day extra to, to recover? Or do you want to have four or five days where you are able to be your best? So I, I do think it's important for employers not to just go with the, 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 the flavor of the month or the news report, but really, you know, spend some time, you know, talk to some professionals, talk to your employee assistance uh, program uh, provider, and, and, and really start foundationally in terms of how you build your cu culture and also how you uh, uh, provide services and make sure that you hear the voice of your employees while doing so. Well, I want to move on to something a little bit of a shift. Well, you know, certainly some organizations are keeping with remote work, which we've all become quite familiar with during the pandemic. Others are requiring staff to return to the office or implementing some sort of hybrid work arrangements. What impl implications do these changing work environments have for workplace mental health? I think the one thing is the word you change that you used because change is stressful. That alone makes this kind of a difficult time. People are trying to figure things out. Will it work? Is it going to stay? You know, it, it feels very volatile. So <clears throat> with any kind of change, you want to make sure that there is really good communication. What's happened with some workplaces is that they've started out with a full remote policy or a hybrid policy, and then they've changed their minds. Uh, which is quite disruptive, but it might be necessary for one reason or another. I can't comment. Uh, but communication around that change, hearing people, understanding personal situations and how you can mitigate that, all of that is just respectful. You know, if you keep that top of mind, that's really important. Um, I do think that there's some definite positives, and I do think that there's some risks in the remote and hybrid work. Uh, the, the positives, and we've heard from employees, are very practical. Um, the positives are I'm not spending as much time commuting and I'm not spending as much money. <laughs> so, you know, if, if people have said that if there is a 10 minute commute where I can walk or, or I don't have to pay, then they would be fine coming into the office. There's not a fear of the office. It's just that commute commute time. Um, the, the, so I think that that allows for that, you know, flexibility and, and that's positive. Um, the, 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 the downside is that I think sometimes the way it's implemented doesn't real, doesn't recognize the fact that other than commute and, and money, people do crave flexibility. Uh, and sometimes the flexibility isn't necessarily just, you know, whether you're in the office Tuesday and Wednesday or not, but if you need to do something, if you really want to do something, you want to uh, attend an after school event with your child, you know, that really is important to people, being able to build in life into work. So we actually found that more people, just slightly more, were uh, interested in the flexibility of hours where they didn't want to, you know, you're not taking away hours, but you had reasonable flexibility about when you work. Uh, because that 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 allowed them to build things into life. The downside of um, the remote work is that you know it allows us a lot of efficiency. You know, you can get stuff done and you can get it done quickly. Um, you can bring people together in different places, but efficiency isn't all that we need as human beings. We need to feel a sense of belonging. We need to feel a sense of connection. You know, having a best friend at work really connects you to the workplace and gives you that sense of belonging. And, and I do fear that we haven't yet learned as well as we should how to work in virtual environments and still build those relationships. It's kind of like, you know, we're all 12 year olds with, 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 with Lamborghinis. We've got these new tools, but we haven't quite learned how to use them in a way that is effective for us yet. So I do think we have to spend some time making sure that we recognize that isolation is a big issue in our, organ in our, in our culture. It had been before the pandemic. It's worse now, and we do not want to make it worse. 
We have to be intentional about our social connection, our social support, or else we'll end up in a very negative place in terms of our mental health. Increasingly, we're seeing that job seekers are paying a lot of attention to an organization's culture, benefits, and work environment. What has your research indicated that employers should be paying close attention to as they find it increasingly competitive to recruit staff? Yeah, well, people pay attention to culture and it's easy to find culture, right? We, you know, they, there's a lot of online forums where employees are very vocal about what it's like to work in an organization and, and vocal in both ways. You know, sometimes people say, well, you, you know, the people who go online are only negative. That's not been my experience. I've seen people actually supporting, you know, positive environments, speaking well and highly of their employers because they want that employer to continue to do what they're doing. So, you know, sometimes you're gated out. You might not even get the resume that you want because somebody's already done background a background check. You don't even have the opportunity to talk to them and tell them anything about what you're doing because they're not interested in you at that point. Um, the other the other thing that we found that's very important is in addition to culture, pe people are wisely recognizing the other side of mental health. Like there's two, what you bring and what your environment brings. And uh, we were a little surprised actually to find that um, flex benefits and uh, services that an organization offers for in terms of mental health was more important, slightly more important than even flexibility. And we know how important flexibility has been. So we know these services can be life-changing. We know these services make a difference to people. Um, in our EAP, every single day, we, we help people who are at risk of dying by suicide. Every single day, we help parents who are in crisis because of an issue with their children. Like these are meaningful supports and organization and individuals are saying, well, you know, if my, if my organization doesn't understand that this is important and doesn't put their money where their mouth is in terms of these tangible resources, then that's a factor in me wanting to work there as well. Whether you want to call it the great resignation, the great reshuffle, or the great retirement, 2022 uh, saw organizations struggling with retention. How does workplace mental health fit into the conversation about employee retention? We looked exactly at that issue and we asked people who were uh, intending to leave, um, you know, what, why, you know, what their, what their experience is. And we thought at that time that there would be a lot of people saying that, you know, whether or not my employer allowed me to work from home was a big issue because we saw a lot about that in the media. I'm not going to stay here because I can't work remote. And that's, that's the case. But the absolute number one factor was uh, a sense of belonging. And that had eroded over the past while. Um, that had eroded over the pandemic. It was very strong. You know, people were very connected because they they needed to kind of work with their employers uh, to get things set up in the in the very beginning. And then slowly over time, uh, that sense of belonging declined in the working population and was the single strongest driver in terms of people wanting to leave. So those people who did feel that connection, they did feel that empathy from their employer, they did have that social uh, network and social support, they were no more at risk of leaving than before the pandemic. And those where it was never even established because maybe, you know, they started to work during the pandemic and it, it just didn't get connected uh, or it declined during the pandemic because that was what happened with many, they were the ones who were more likely to look. Hmm. Well, that's a very meaningful uh, statistic there. That's um, really, really interesting. Are there any other current trends related to workplace mental health that nonprofit leaders should be paying attention to this year? Yeah, I think um, it's not a trend. It's just really more, uh, well, well, one is a trend and one is uh, just a fact. Um, I mentioned in passing, and I don't want it to be in passing. I want people to sort of understand this. Uh, we are at a point right now in our population health where we are more sensitive to stress. 
We have been through a lot. We are still in a point of upheaval. We have additional stressors, you know, economic stressors that are on top of us. The population is more on edge. So I think it's important to recognize that because, you know, you, you might be on edge and you don't recognize it. So how you communicate might be more harsh, might be more negative. You know, you might have a little bit more cynicism when something comes to you and you have to, you have to be aware that that's a possibility so you can stop yourself and understand how your words might be impacting someone else. And from the other side, you know, you might have someone who's responding to you in a way that, you know, takes you aback. And the last thing you want to do is to escalate that. Just recognize that we're all in, under stress and, and take a beat. Take a, uh, a, a, a few minutes. Remember that we have to be intentional in terms of supporting each other so people don't feel that lack of connection because we've lost it a little bit. So I, I think just that recognition is important for our inter in, inter interactions. So that's the trend. That's where we are right now. And I hope to come back and speak to you another time and say, well, no, we're in a better place. Um, the other, uh, we should definitely be in a more aware place, even if we're not in a better place. Um, the other thing is that there is, you know, much heightened awareness of the business impact of mental health. And this, this has been the case forever. You know, this is not new. It's just the awareness is greater. And I want to make sure that we fan the flames of that, that, that awareness. Everything that I am talking to you and to business leaders about and you're sharing with your audience is not only for the benefit of the individual. It's definitely for the benefit of the individual, but it correlates with productivity. It not only correlates with retention, uh, but it correlates with innovation with creativity, uh, with collaboration, with discretionary effort, with all the things that make a difference in whether you're successful or not, whether you're a for-profit or a not-for-profit organization. When people have the undue burden of anxiety, fear, lack of safety, lack of a pathway to get support if they need it on a personal level, that is putting undue strain on their brain that, that they that therefore cannot, even with the best of their intentions, allow them to be their full and most productive selves at work. Well, that is extremely insightful. Um, I want to thank you so much, Paula, for joining us on Charity Village Connects and sharing your insights and advice. It's so appreciated by our audience of nonprofit professionals, and I'm sure it'll be very, very helpful for leaders of those organizations in, in managing their, their people, their, taking care of their people better. So um, thank you again, Paula. And thank you. And I'm, I'm just so happy that you've had uh, this topic as, as one that you're showcasing. So, you know, congratulations, Mary. <laughs> thank you.